uh, Lee Harrison and Kang Lee are going to be presenting Arms Race, the, secure, uh, the story of insecure bootloaders. And with that, First, thank you, Shmukan. Uh, my name is Kang Lee. I attend Shmukan a few times before, but this is the first time speaking. Uh, and also, uh, here's my uh, co-speaker, Lee Harrison. Uh, we are here uh, try to come to talk about the secure bootloading. Uh, I also, also, you might think about it as insecure bootloading. Okay? Uh, before I start, I want to first talk about the uh, mobile device ecosystem. Uh, so, in this ecosystem we have the following players. Uh, device manufacturers, and these are the system builder and the manufacturers for the mobile device, uh, for example Samsung, Apple, and uh, Qualcomm. And uh, there's also the service providers, the, uh, for example AT&T and Verizon. Uh, the other part, the la large part of the ecosystem is actually uh, the customers, uh, us, like you and me, uh, we are the device owners. Uh, I put a code there, you know, we are the owners, but uh, later you'll see we are also the potential, uh, the, you know, the so-called attackers. Uh, so <coughs> why we need to look at the bootloaders? Uh, in fact, what we try to do is to show you how to deal with lots of the uh, lockdown happening in this ecosystem. Uh, there are different levels of lockdowns. And we often use the term, you probably heard the term, I use the term rules or jailbreaking a lot. But uh, in, in practice, there's actually multiple levels of, uh, you can say, jailbreaking happening, or uh, lockdown happening. So at the very top levels, people, uh, most users want to say, I, I want to install some application, and I just want to need the roots to the system. Uh, but there, if you go lower layer, uh, say, if you, for users, even if you have roots, it doesn't mean you can install a new kernel. So if you want to install a customized Linux kernel, it might need additional effort. And later, like even if you have a customized kernel you install, it doesn't mean you can change the bootloader. So sometimes you might have to go even lower to try to uh, help you break up, break, uh, break, uh, help you uh, break the higher level lockdowns. So when in general, whenever you have a lower level you know, a lockdown you, you broke, in general you, it will be easier for you to get upper layer. So in this talk, we're going to focus on the lower part. So we look at bootloader, uh, mostly try to uh, see how to run a customized kernel, or sometimes we also need to try to modify the bootloader, try to you know, help to install the customized kernel uh, easier. We're now going to talk about the, uh, how to get root access to your phone. Okay? Uh, now, I have a few disclaimers first before we go to the talk. Uh, I want to lower your expectation a little bit. Uh, there's, in this talk, we're not going to disclose any new, newly discovered bootloader flaws. Uh, we are actually under, uh, we are, we are cl collaborating with the, uh, a few uh, mobile providers, so we are not allowed to talk about anything new. And in fact, I don't think we have anything completely new yet. Okay? And all the bugs we present here, are, uh, has already been patched, at least in the device we're going to talk about. And uh, all the bugs are found uh, independently by us. Uh, just one example, we have, we're going to show about six bugs, uh, but one of them, uh, there's a, uh, a group, they actually disclose uh, this, uh, they, they find this simultaneously with us, they actually communicate with us, uh, but they disclose it first. Okay. We'll make that clear in the later uh, slides. Uh, with all these disclaimers, then you might say, hey, uh, why do you want to make the talk? You know, we already know all this. Okay. Uh, the important thing is bootloader security is really unique and fine. Okay? So why I say uh, this thing is unique? First, uh, when we look at the software, uh, when we reverse the software and we look at, uh, we can sense that all this software was developed under you know, huge time pressure. I understand like lots of the software product has, you know, have the same issue. It has to ship to the market. But on the mobile market, this is really critical. And if they miss a deadline, what I heard is that they're going to miss, you know, they have to have huge penalty payback to the service provider. So that's one unique part. Uh, the other unique part is that the threat source as I mentioned earlier, you know, we all have mobile device, and you are the attackers that they are trying to prevent against. Okay? So uh, the owner are one of the potential attack source. And in addition, it's different from other, you know, lots of other security problems. 
it's that you have the physical access. So you know, it's, it's sort of unconventional to lots of the software security we look at on the internet. Uh, another aspect of this is that based on the uh, bugs we find, some of the bugs are not really conventional. You, know, uh, you, you might play a lot with the memory vulnerability, double free, you know, uh, you play with a lot of those. Well, that's not we see here, okay? Uh, so with that, I'm going to first give you some uh, basic instruction about the, uh, the terminology on the pieces uh, related to this talk. Uh, I show a phone here. Uh, this is actually uh, the back side of the Samsung S4, uh, one, of, one version of it. There are parts are familiar with probably by all of you, like, you know, for example, I show there's a SIM card. You can you know, put a card there. Uh, there's also external flash card you can put in. You, know, you can put your music, movie, whatever there. Uh, there's a few other piece that's important, but it's really hard for us to pinpoint where it is. Some of these are in the SOC chip. Some of that really probably hide, you know, deeply on the circuit, and uh, you cannot remove it. So uh, one example is this E-fuse. E-fuse, you can consider these are write once memory. So you can only write it once. Okay? And on these uh, E-fuse, you have all this of uh, phone specific, individual phone specific numbers, like for example serial number, and uh, most of you probably run into this, like if you upgrade your phone, the patch is going to blow some of the fuse, and that's not reversible, so which means like it's hard for you to downgrade. Okay? So there are lots of other uh, information there. Another important piece is this EMMC, uh, is an internal flash, you can consider this really like the same as your flash card, although it's just like uh, it's a piece of memory that it's very hard for you to pull out. Okay? On this card, it has the, it, it's, it's really a disk. You have the partition table, you have all the bootloader, the, the later stage of bootloaders uh, saved there. You also have the kernel image stored there. Another related piece is the ROM. This is a read-only memory that like when you power on your uh, phone, the, the code you know, start has come from there. Okay? So the prime bootloader is from there. Now, with that, let's look at the very generic view on how a, uh, a phone boot. So this is a high-level view of a bootloader, uh, how it works, and later you will see an uh, individual phone, how it works uh, for each, uh, for each uh, type we bring here. So when you power up, as I mentioned earlier, that your ROM is going to get executed, the code come from there. That piece of code is going to look at the flash and find uh, you know, the first stage of a bootloader and run from there. And obviously, before it runs it, I always check the signature of that code. If it match with the vendor you know, built-in or, or whatever specified by the code, then it will hand it to that new, uh, new stage of a bootloader and then run from there. This might go through multiple runs, and you will see this later. And at the end, the last stage will then read the kernel, let's say Android Linux kernel, then get it run. Now, here's a quick overview about how the bootloader works. And uh, uh, basically, this goes through multiple run, and I, I have a really simplified version. Let's say on the right side, you already have a, a lower level bootloader running there. What it does is it's going to read the next level bootloader and uh, try to load in the memory. But before it's handed the execution over to the next level, it will double check some of the signature. So on the disk for the next level bootloader, it's certainly there's a file, you can consider our partition, store this. It has header, has the, the code, the image there. There's also a sign signature. So what this current level bootloader is going to do is it's going to read the code into memory and then do a hash it's going to get another hash out from the signature by decrypt it with a, there's a public key probably in bar, uh, buried in the uh, current level of bootloader. Only when this hash match, then it will proceed, hand it over to the next level of bootloader. So this is a really high level overview. Now with all this background set, we're going to enter a few case studies. So the very first one, uh, we played with is this uh, Samsung Galaxy S3. It's been released about one and a half year ago, and uh, what it uses is a Qualcomm uh, chip. So our goal, f the first thing when we play with it, is try to just put a customized kernel image. 
Okay. Now, if you look at the bootloader, the, the whole process for this S3 phone, uh, it starts from ROM. This is the, uh, come from the read-only memory. And it's going to read in multiple level bootloader. And this, the SPL 1, 2, 3, and also the later A boot all store on the internal uh, flash disk. And each level can verify the next level before it hands the execution over there. And you can see that SPL 1, SPL 2, 3, and each load the next one. And uh, each of this bootloader actually has its own task. For example, the SPL2 not only load SPL3, it also load other component, like for, for example, the power, uh, resource management, and the trust zone. Uh, what we're going to focus on for this talk is we're only going to focus on how to put the customized kernel, so the trust zone, which is a very important part, very, very interesting, but we're not, we're not, uh, today we're not going to talk about it. Okay. So we're going to focus on the A-boot. Now, remember, our goal is to try to load a customized kernel. So if we can trick the A-boot, you know, they, they are doing some verification. If we can trick the A-boot to load our kernel rather than the, the stock kernel, then we should achieve our goal. So we look at how the uh, A-boots verify the, the kernel image. So uh, what we did is really get the binary from the flash. It, we don't have the source code. So put in either... Uh, is a little bit tweak, then we have the, you know, the pseudocode, and when you look at the pseudocode, uh, when you have the, the decompiled C code, then uh, we figure out that the A boot actually checking a, a, does the following. It loads the kernel image into memory twice. So first it copy to the place that uh, it wants to execute it, and then before it jumps there, it will make another copy to a scratch memory, and do the verification there, and then if it passes the verification, then it will jump. Now, give you a little bit more detail. The data are read from the disk, the internal flash, and there's a partition table, and each of the, uh, you know, there's multiple partition, and the kernel is in one of the partition, you know, it's called boot, okay? And this is very similar to your hard, hard drive partition table, although it's on the flash. Now, more detail. Here we bring the pseudo code of the. Uh, right. In the S3 case, it's actually that section is readable. We will later talk about, depending on which phone, some of the you know, put section is not readable. So this part is readable. The protection rely on, you know, if, if you modify it, you need to have the right signature. Okay. Now, if you look at the code, here are the really simplified version. Uh, the loading effort first. It basically search the partition, find there's a partition called boot, then you know, copy it into memory. Okay. Then on the right side, on the, uh, the green box, we have the verification stage. It's same thing. You go there, look at the partition table, check whether it's boot, okay, then you know, verify. If it's good, then later jump to the one that loaded by the blue. Now for those of you who have sharp eyes, you, all, you might already noticed, okay, there's some problem. Okay. And, and you're right. So the, the, the difference is like there are two uh, string comparison, uh, but there are different ones. One is string copy, which is case sensitive. The other one is case insensitive. Uh, we suspect this actually comes from different developers. You know, one guy is writing the code and the other way adding the checking. And now like for, for this audience, it's obvious. Like, we have an easy exploitation. Okay, now we will get more complicated stuff later, but you know, one thing I said unconventional is that Lots of time you just have this type of simple bugs, right? Now the way you claim victory is the following. You create two partitions. One is called boot, the other one also called boot, but one is case, you know, capital, the other one is lowercase. So what, at the end, what happened is that the one load is our kernel, the one being checked is the other one, okay? So, you know, you can go, go ahead and like, check which one you want to put first. But uh, because of time issue, we just move, move, ahead, move ahead. So we have a small victory. Of course, uh, Samsung respond very quickly. They patch it. You know, uh, they uh, they actually just load it once, so there's no you know, mismatch anymore. So let's look at the next case. Now we actually start look at the Note 2. This is also a, a phone released fairly recent. You know, with, you know, about a year. This time it was not using Qualcomm chip. It's actually using the Samsung their own chip. Okay, and that's our, we still have the same goal. Okay, we want to put the you know, customized kernel. Uh, we want to trick the latest stage of the bootloader and to try to say, can we do something? And 
This is a detailed boot uh, loading process for the Note 2. And uh, you can see that the, the, the boot process actually changed a little bit. And for the Samsung's, their own chip, they don't use the A boot. They have this uh, chain called BL1, BL2, BL3. And overall, this, this chain is called S boot. It's actually in the S boot section. Okay. And because our goal is to try to load the kernel, obviously, uh, we, let's focus on the last stage of boot loader first. Okay. Then we did the same thing. We, you know, this time we get the code and we look at it. And this is how they load the, the image. So eventually somewhere it will check, okay, so this is an image that has a magic sequence of Android. Well, we're going to load in kernel and copy. I know like because I showed you early slides, you're probably still looking hard, try to see where's the, you know, where's the trouble. Uh, we actually look hard here. And, uh, uh, in this section, it's actually not much problem. They, they load the kernel, they copy this, and then later they, they, they jump to that place to run. What I didn't show you, and in fact, we, when we look at closely, we actually find there's the else branch. Okay? So again, you feel like, oh, it's trivial. Okay? And there's the else branch. If you have an you know, image you try to load, it doesn't have the Android sequence. What the, uh, the bootloader does is it just you know jump there. Now it doesn't do lots of the setup. It just jump there and run. Okay. And now you say, oh, this is this is trivial. See, part of the part of the, the talk is try to tell you actually you know bootloader sounds you know, complicated. It can be a simple bug. Okay. So, so you have this flash rate. All you need to do is prepare the the code put there and and they will they will run. And <coughs> so we have this small victory. Okay, we have this else branch, probably a uh, yeah, debugging patch or something help us to run. However, this is really, this bug happened there is really, you know, very primitive, like in the sense that when you try to load the kernel, the lots of setup work need to be done, and all you have is, like, you, you have an ability to jump to your code. Uh, you can actually write your own bootloader and then maybe use a customized kernel, like, and, and run there, but you need to do lots of setup. What we really want is we want to, to uh, leverage the uh, original bootloader we want to modify it rather than just, you know, develop everything from scratch from our, you know, by ourselves. So for the complicated stuff, then I'm going to, let my co-speaker Lee to handle it from here. All right, so we can load a kernel. We'd have to write our own loader. That's kind of a hassle. So let's see if we can modify the early bootloader stages, see if we can avoid having to write all that code and just be able to simplify the kernel loading. So first we'll look at, well, what happens if we change the bootloader? So we initially encounter the problem. The bootloader is signed. Any modification we make, will obviously break the signature. So how can we solve this? To do that, we're going to first look at how the first stage bootloader is verified from the ROM. And we find that the boot ROM actually uses a fixed key in part of its verification process. And we realize this can help us. Because after looking at a couple devices, we realized the same key was used across all CPUs of the same model. So every Exynos 4 device use the same key in the CPU. Well, how can that help us? Well, it turns out we found this one hobby board, the Odroid X, that actually ships with a first stage bootloader that does not verify the signature of the second stage. So this is a pretty big hole. So from here, we can actually make a custom bootloader. So if we take their first stage bootloader, we can glue it with the second and third stage from the original device, say the Note 2. And if we put that together, we can create a bootloader that the device will load, verify, and then run. So this is pretty good so far. But the problem here is the bootloader partition, unlike on the S3, we can't read and write to this partition. Android cannot actually see where the bootloader is stored. So we're gonna have to get around this. To do that, we're gonna look at how the bootloader is stored on the EMSV chip, on the internal flash. So the bootloader is stored on the uh, boot one partition, the first one in kind of orange there. Android can only see the blue partition, the user data, as it were. So we need to find some method to write to this new boot one partition. 
and replace the existing bootloader. So obviously, how do we do that? So then we remembered, wait, all these devices have to be updated in case they find flaws just like we have. So in that update process, they also have to update the bootloader. So the firmware update mechanism has a way to write to this partition. So the phone has a special download mode that it boots into. It's not uh, the same as booting up into the full kernel, say Android. But it lets you see everything. It lets you flash to this boot one partition. But like any good flashy program, it does also check the signature, which if we try to flash our cobbled together custom bootloader, it won't verify. So we need to find a way around the signature check. So we're very close, almost there. We just gotta find one more thing. So we can disable that check. Because before we'd found an exploit that allowed us to load up whatever code we wanted, doesn't matter if it was signed or not, and then it have the phone executed. And that was that uh, debugging else branch that we saw earlier. So using that, we can write some code that will run and kind of disable the checks in the current bootloader. So then when you put the phone into the download mode, all the security checks are gone. And so then the uh, bootloader will let you flash our custom, our new custom bootloader to the device without any issues. So here we can claim victory because we've been able to install our own custom bootloader that now requires no modifications to the kernel when you boot. So you, you can take the results of the compilation process for the kernel and immediately throw it on your phone and it'll run, which is pretty good for us because that was our goal. All right, so they're very prompt again in fixing that issue uh, because they removed that else branch. And they also added the blacklisting of older bootloaders, so you couldn't try to downgrade to the old version and then use the same exploit to install a custom bootloader back on it. So they've kind of beefed up the security, and we're gonna have to find another hole. So obviously we need another method for putting our custom bootloader onto that boot partition. So we can't remove the flash security checks anymore. So let's go back and take a look at the firmware update mechanism. So we know it's doing some checks. Before, we never really investigate the checks because we realized uh, we could just remove them. So it doesn't really matter what they're checking, we could just patch it out. But now we actually have to care a bit. So what kind of checks are they doing? It's uh, an RSA signature very similar to the generic diagram we showed you in the beginning. So when are they doing these checks? Well, it turns out not every partition that gets flashed needs to be signature checked. And they actually have a hard-coded list of names. So only when you flash a partition that has the name that's in that list will it run the signature check. So uh, then we can look, where does it get the partition information? So they have another structure, a partition information table, or the PIT. Uh, it's kind of a secondary table in addition to the uh, GPT that we saw earlier. It just contains additional uh, metadata they use for the flashing process. But luckily for us, the root user can edit this table. It's on the disk, the part of the disk that's visible to the Android OS. So here we see a, uh, an example of the eMMC chip, the flash chip. We have the GPT at the very beginning. The pit is not far after that. And then later on we have the full boot partition, the recovery partition, and so on. We can zoom in on the pit. We see the pit has a header. The pit has entries for each partition on the disk, just like the GPT. And these entries are gonna have additional data, like the partition ID, what file system type it is, and then they will also point to the part where the partition data is on the disk, along with the size and a couple other. So, how are we gonna use this pit to bypass the flash check? So what we're gonna do is gonna create a duplicate pit entry for the bootloader partition. But, we're gonna change the name. So because the 
decide whether to run the signature check or not based on the name of the partition you're gonna flash, or we'll just call it something else that's not in that list. But the key point here is we're gonna have this, these two entries, the original bootloader entry and our custom bootloader entry, they're gonna point to the same location on the disk. So here we have an original pit, it's got the boot entry that later points to the boot data. Now we have our custom my boot entry. It's also going to point to the boot data. So the boot is, part, is on the list, so it's going to be signature checked during the flashing process. My boot is probably not going to be on their list, so that won't be checked. But if my boot is able to be flashed, it will flash to the same location as boot would have been. So, we can use that trick to flash our custom bootloader back on the device. And uh, so that did work, and we were able to get it back on there and then boot custom kernels once again. And we're gonna <laughs> hit this poor note too one more time at uh, a lightning round. So in a subsequent update, they added a signature check on the pit region at boot time. So if you turn on the phone and the pit was tampered with, it won't boot up any further. It will force you to go into download mode. It won't let you exit until you flash a, an untampered pit. So they keep, they keep adding more locks, so we can't add our entry anymore, so we can't kind of bypass the mechanism. But <laughs> the downgrade, we can downgrade, because even though they added this blacklist in one of the previous updates, they forgot that blacklist the previous version. So you could just flash back the one that was vulnerable to the pit attack and then use that. But this one was also fixed. So we're, we're done with that note too. And we're gonna move on to the Galaxy S4. This one, uh, a little bit more recent, uh, about April last year. This is uh, also based on a Qualcomm chip. So we're moving back to Qualcomm from the Samsung Exynos. And uh, what's different about this one is that other carriers also asked to lock down the device, because uh, in the past, it, it's really been, say, Verizon that has wanted the uh, phones to be very secure. But now, uh, this is just AT&T, you're also asking, hey, don't let them boot custom kernels. But obviously, our goal is still to boot a custom kernel. So we're gonna bring this picture back. Uh, probably looks familiar, it actually is the exact same boot flow as in the S3. This is very typical for the Qualcomm based phones. And we're again gonna look at the A boot. So we're gonna look at how A boot is gonna load this kernel into memory. So let's pretend we're running, the execution is inside A boot. So the goal is to have ABU load the kernel and, and the RAM disk into memory. So how's it gonna do that? It's gonna use uh, this MMC read function. So the first thing it's gonna do, it's gonna read uh, the beginning of the partition, read a header into just a local variable. Then it has two subsequent reads that are gonna load the kernel and the RAM disk from that same partition. And uh, this should put everything into memory. Now, knowing that, what, what can go wrong? So there's a, a very big uh, hole here. I just feel like we already show a few really silly, you know, not, not really complicated bugs. I, I just re really try to see maybe some audience can point out what can go wrong. So this is not really difficult. We have time, that's why I, I pause. No one respond. <laughs> All right. So there is something that can go wrong. So that header that it reads, who controls that? Well, you do. It's on the disk. You can write to the disk. And then what does it do for the second and third read? It uses information from that header to control where and how much data is loaded into memory. So it's only gonna load the kernel to wherever you say to load the kernel. It's going to only get to load the RAM disk to wherever you say. So we can abuse that because these are user controlled values. So hopefully you spot the problem. There's no input validation 
for the addresses, the size. If we change the address, we can load code anywhere, even on top of the bootloader itself. Uh, for this one, yes, you do need, you would need to be root to be able to write to that partition directly. But, uh, yeah. So, we're going to change the loading process a bit. We're going to have the second MMC read, the first, or that originally just loaded the kernel. We're going to have it load a combined kernel and RAM disk because we need that sec, that third read to load up some code. That code is going to actually overwrite the signature check function in the bootloader. So later when the bootloader loads up all the code, it tries to call the function to verify it, well it'll actually call our custom code. And they can, that, our code can just say, sure, that, that's all right. And uh, this one was first published by security re researcher Dan Rosenberg, so good shout out to him. Uh, this also affects many other vendors, uh, like LG, a lot of LG phones can use this too. So to illustrate the uh, exploit, so we have the first MMC read, it's loaded the header into the RAM. The second MMC read is gonna load our combined kernel on RAM disk. And then the third will load our patch code directly on top of the bootloader. So we can control uh, how the verification happens in the bootloader now. All right, that's enough for that exploit. I'm gonna pass it back to. Okay. So I'm gonna summarize this. Uh, uh, so there's actually a bunch of uh, vulnerability or bugs we mentioned. I, I'm, I have the list there. I'm not gonna go through each of this, but uh, yeah, since it's really a quiet audience, I, I want to summarize the following way. Uh, so my experience, uh, my view on this is that. Uh, when you have the hardware, when you own the device, when you're also able to modify lots of it, this is like, uh, you know, lots of problems actually are input validation problem, not, not really like, like memory vulnerability. So this is like really like, you, want to, you need to do SQL injection, but you also own the SQL database. Okay, so that's the, the, so what I'm trying to say is that the bootloader, although it's, you know, it sounds complicated, but the attack, you know, since you have the advantage, you own the stuff, there are lots of things you can do. And, and also this, I guess, say the other way, you know, if you want to secure the bootloader, it's really, really difficult. Uh, so uh, that's why I, I say most of these are not necessarily the conventional vulnerability. And uh, so from the vendor point of view, it's pretty difficult for them. And uh, I also want to say that the problem are not limited to Samsung. We, we show a few examples with Samsung. That's because we have access to the device and also because uh, they actually acknowledged and, uh, you know, patched it. Uh, rumor says that actually some of our bugs still uh, available for other devices. I cannot say that. Uh, so, but at least here, uh, for all the bugs we show, they've already been patched. Uh, at, but at the same time, you can tell that because of this type of simple uh, bugs, it means that, you know, all of you, if you're interested, you, can, you might have to jump on and work on it. Okay? Uh, so, on the other hand, uh, when we talk to the vendors, we actually know that vendors are uh, very open uh, to let you put your customized kernel uh, as long as you buy a device from them, uh, they will be happy. Uh, so, very often the, uh, the request for lockdown the kernel, uh, lockdown the device is often come from the service, service provider. Uh, this is because they're a business model. So uh, with all that said, uh, you know, I want to you know, conclude the talk basically saying, uh, you know, this is a good experience. Uh, this is our story about going multiple rounds of, uh, you know, working on the bootloader, you know, work it, get a patch, and work it again. Uh, so you guys, if you have questions, we're more than happy to answer. I haven't done any uh, work on Apple. Uh, I think uh, obviously we want to Apple maybe donate more hardware than we will play with it. Uh, obviously, I don't know, Lead, have you? I have not. Oh, he said no. Uh, 
uh, we actually in the process try to get uh, uh, the software and we have the hardware actually able to run Knox but uh, Knox was targeted for enterprise customers and we need to get the access to the software. We are in the process of getting it. Right, so yeah, so the question is, you know, if the e-fuse are now real e-fuse that is supposedly right only once, if you can reverse it, obviously uh, if you can do that, that saves lots of uh, dead phones and uh, we're definitely more than happy to hear, you know, how to do it. We don't know it, about it and, and I heard the rumor but I never, you know, able to get. Okay. Thank you.